You've just home, uh, submitted homework number three, and homework four is due a week from today. Uh, did everybody get the message I sent out yesterday with the small recording on Excel? I'm not sure how many people are uh, using the app. I think iLearn, if you have a smartphone, you can download the iLearn app. And then it'll pop up as a notification right on your smartphone. Or if you're not using that, it'll go to your email. But um, yesterday I figured since I had some extra time and it was the weekend, I'd do something fun. And so I recorded a little video having to do with Excel just to show you a C curve and the F curve. It's something we'd already talked about in class. But um, I just wanted to give you a little extra help for the homework, so I recorded a short video. I think some of you saw it, and it sounds like maybe some people weren't aware of it. So I just encourage you to install the iLearn app onto your uh, smartphone or check your emails occasionally, because from, from time to time I might put supplementary videos together like that. Um, today we're going to start on Chapter 5. And so um, if you're already reading the textbook, I'd encourage you to keep doing that. It's a good habit to review the textbook and refresh your learning after the lectures are done. We're going to be going through in-class exercise number seven. And it's some water chemistry. Everybody here is already taking chemistry, right? Is it two semesters of chemistry at AUS or one? One semester. And so it's probably a lot of inorganic chemistry that you've already had. And, it, and so I, I think much of what we're doing may be a review for some of you. And uh, I'm sure uh, that uh, if you took chemistry a long time ago, maybe it won't seem like a review. So we'll maybe be starting from scratch. Uh, before we get into it, I just wanted to mention one thing from the quiz. Um, you know, I took a a scan of this. It was a student solution, someone who did a really nice job on the quiz. For the question about the plug flow reactor and kinetics, this is a, a really important issue and you need to learn it. If you don't understand it or if you missed points on the quiz, I promise you, you'll have the same exact question again. I, I'm, I'm going to keep pounding on this point because it's so important. The combination of reactor kinetics and the uh, reaction kinetics and the reactor that it happens in. And so what I liked about this student answer for the quiz is that it mentioned that in the plug flow reactor, it keeps material separate. And so that what's going into the reactor, since it's separate from what's going out, it has a high concentration. And remember, in first order kinetics, when the concentration is high, the rate of the reaction is high. And in contrast to that, in the completely mixed flow reactor, once it comes in, it's mixed and everything has the same concentration, which is lower. And so there's going to be a slower reaction because the concentration is lower. So first order kinetics, just to emphasize, first order kinetics, the rate of the reaction depends partly on the concentration of the reactants. So what's great about a plug flow reactor is it keeps the high concentration separate from the low concentration, which means down here at the beginning of the reactor, the rate of the reaction is very quick. And so that's what this student wrote. Um, there were a few others that I thought were just as good. I didn't have uh, you know, space in the lecture notes to show every good solution. This was just one of them. So if that's still an unfamiliar idea, I'd encourage you to read through the book. We can talk a little bit about it, but have you got a question? A second order reaction is, e is even, yeah, it's amplified because the concentration uh, squared is the function for the radio reaction. That's right. Okay. So this is review, I hope. The idea of moles and Avogadro's number, it sounds like avocado, which always makes me hungry when I hear Avogadro's number because I start thinking about like a nice avocado juice, you know, it's so delicious. Um, the definition of a mole is a certain number of particles, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd particles. And probably that number is like one of the constants that's burned into your memory, right? In the periodic table, which I gave you one today, on the back of the in-class exercise, here's the periodic table. It has all the elements listed. And uh, the number at the bottom of each box is the molecular weight 
which means it's the number of grams required for a mole of particles. So it's how many grams of, for example, carbon is required for a mole. So we go to carbon, which is element 6. It says 12.0107 grams per mole. Now, the reason why it's not an even number is because some carbon, oh, we won't go into isotopes. It's just, anyways, that, that's, the, uh, that's the number of grams re required for a mole. Now, equivalence takes into account the charge of the particle. And so some uh, atoms exist as a neutrally charged, and some atoms exist as a uh, multivalent charge. So, for example, sodium, when you add salt into water, salt is sodium and chloride, and that's a salt, so NaCl. When you add it to water, it goes into the Na, which is positively charged, and the Cl, which is negatively charged. Now, that's a little bit different from if it was MgSO4, because Mg has a charge of 2. So Mg goes to 2 plus, and the sulfate, we'll say, is 2 minus. So in equivalence, you're taking into account how much of something is required to get a mole of charge. And so the number of moles and equivalents is the same if the thing that we're talking about has a charge of 1. But they'll be off by a factor of 2 if it has a charge of 2, off by a factor of 3 if it has a charge of 3. And we'll face that in today's in-class exercise. Let's do that right now, in fact. So question one, I'm asking you to talk about, uh, we're talking about something um, iron, and then in A and B, it's pretty straightforward problems, but in then C and D, we'll get into the issue of equivalence with uh, the charge of iron three. So let me pause the recording, take a look at that, and of course you can collaborate with your colleagues and try and solve just question one for now, and I'll circulate around with the answer. Let's look at that last part there. So, okay. In the first one, we were finding the, uh, just the molecular weight. The second one, it was how many atoms per gram. The third one, how many grams per mole of charge. And then the fourth one, we're trying to find out how much charge is there per gram of iron. So you take, basically, the amount of charge per mole and divide it by the, uh, the mass required for an equivalent. So 18.615. So there's 3.23 times 10 to the 22nd charged particles per gram of iron. All right. So here's the periodic table. You'll sometimes see it formatted a little bit differently, but um, this is the version that I'll provide you when we have quizzes and exams. It's pretty simple. Uh, it even tells you what the elements are. Sometimes the periodic table doesn't list the name of it, and so some of the uh, things don't match up with what you'd expect, like potassium is K. You'd have to just maybe remember, but in this case it has the element name, so that makes it a little bit easier for you. Okay, so we talked about moles and equivalents so far. Molarity is now when we're talking about a concentration, the number of moles in a liter of solution. And so now in this uh, second part of today's in-class exercise, what I'd like you to do is consider uh, 1710 grams of H2SO4 is added to a liter, of, a liter of water. And so molarity is when you are calculating the number of moles per liter. And then normality is when you're finding out how many equivalents per liter. Okay, looking at this formula, H2SO4, what do you think is the charge? The, uh, the hydrogen ion is plus one, and there's two of them. And so the ratio between equivalents and moles is going to be two for this example. I'll just give you that hint as you get started on finding the molarity and normality. 
So the definition of molarity, remember, is number of moles. So I've told you a mass. You need to calculate the molecular weight of H2SO4. It's not going to you know, uh, just be one thing that you look up. You're going to have to add things together. You're going to have the H2SO4. And so H times 2 times whatever the molecular weight is. S is going to be times 1 times whatever the molecular weight is. And then O, there's four of those, 4 times this. And then you need to find the sum of it all. And that is the molecular weight of H2SO4. OK? So let's talk about the units of, uh, of this solution. We have 1710 grams of H2SO4. And uh, by adding up the number of hydrogen atoms, which is two, one sulfur, four oxygen, we get the molecular weight is 98.079. Sometimes when we're just doing things quickly, we would say you know, two times one, 32, 4 times 16, you know, because it's so close to those, rounding off. So, like in a quiz, if you said 98 instead of 98.079, I'd probably be lenient. That, that'd be fine. There's others here. There are other things in that periodic table that aren't quite as uh, suitable for rounding off easily. If you look like at cadmium, for example, element 48. Its molecular weight is 112.411. So you wouldn't want to round that off to 112. But these are all close enough that it would probably be OK to round off. Anyway, so we've got the mass of this H2SO4. And we convert it into the number of moles. The problem statement says that that is uh, added to a liter of water. Or more specifically, that mass is added to enough water to make the total of the H2SO4 and the water equal to one liter. So it's probably a little bit less than a liter of water. Um, but the definition of capital M is moles per liter. That's how to interpret M. What that means is moles per liter. And so the number of moles, 17.4, our total volume is one liter. If you have a problem where it's a different number of liters, like if this was if it was this much H2SO4 added to two liters of water, then our molarity would be half of what it is here, because we'd have to divide by two liters instead of by one. But in this case, it was just one liter of water. Now, what about the, uh, the normality, the number of equivalents per liter of solution? So for that one, what we're going to want to do is um, take into account that when you have this acid disassociating, you get two hydrogen ions. And so you're going to get 17.4 times two particles of H plus. And so the normality of the solution is double the molarity. So 34.8 normal H2SO4. So the definition of N, you see the capital N there? The definition of N is the uh, number of uh, charge per liter of solution. So we have twice as much charge as we do particles, uh, as the original molecule that's added. Uh, Like if it had more than one constituent? Um, yeah, that's a good idea for a quiz question. Maybe I'll think of something like that. But now let's say like if you had uh, both sodium and um, calcium in a solution, you could just divide one of them by one because sodium would have a plus one charge. Divide the other one by two because it has a plus two charge. It's the same principle if you have more than one compound. All right.
You probably um, remember that the definition of pH is the negative log of the hydrogen ion concentration. So this, I hope, the, the pH, the definition of pH should be very familiar. Um, does anybody know what those brackets mean? Concentration in what terms? Is it milligrams per liter? What? The brackets means actually something technically, very specific. It means moles per liter. And so when it's in the brackets like that, that means how many moles per liter of hydrogen ion concentration, of hydrogen ion are there? That's how to find the pH. So in the third and final part of today's in-class exercise, what I'd like you to do is go through the steps of, you know a mass of H2SO4, what is going to be the pH, and then we're going to talk about a neutralization reaction. So let me put on the board what happens when you add both an acid and a base together. You have to uh, be familiar with neutralization in water chemistry because we're going to have this a lot in drinking water treatment where we want to change the pH of something. So if you add, for example, um, H2SO4, what it goes into is two hydrogens and SO4, which has a minus two charge. We're going to be neutralizing it with sodium hydroxide, NaOH. When that's in solution, it exists as Na plus and OH minus, right. So you're going to need one OH for each hydrogen ion that you're neutralizing. Okay? I'm going to turn you loose on that. I'll be circulating around with the solution if you want to check as you get going on part A. Okay, so let me scroll down here to the last one. Of course, these recordings are posted online so that if you want to uh, refresh your memory later, the videos are always there. So we have a pH of 2.69. Now in the last part it says how much of the sodium hydroxide is needed if we want to neutralize the acid. So we want to have it balanced. We want the OH to cancel out the H. And so we know that we need, we know how many moles of NaOH is needed. Because we've got this many moles of charge. So we need to have that same number of moles of OH to cancel it out, to neutralize it. So here in the solution you can see we need 0 0.00204048 moles of sodium hydroxide. Do the same thing as we did here to find the molecular weight. You go to sodium, which is 23, oxygen 16, hydrogen 1. Adding it all up is 40 grams per mole. So you just multiply the molecular weight by the number of moles that we need, and then that tells you the grams and then multiply by a thousand to get milligrams. Yeah, it's not very clear, is it? Let me see if I can uh, pan up a little bit better. Usually I make a PDF, but today I forgot to do that. I don't think that's going to get any better. Let me dim the lights. That'll help. All right, well, time flies when you're having fun, they say. And uh, we've just been doing chemistry, so that's the most fun you can have, right? Uh, be sure and uh, put your in-class exercise on the chair as you leave so that I can give you the credit for being here today. And we'll continue talking about uh, water chemistry when we get together on Tuesday. We'll actually be doing water chemistry uh, all week. On Thursday is going to be reaction kinetics again, but um, we'll talk more about this stuff when we get together next time.